thank you so much, Melanie. And of course, uh, now we'll just introduce uh, the presenters for the next session. And uh, the focus for the uh, next session is training, learning, and also looking to the future. Uh, what next um, after links or after this meeting? And um, uh, the people to host us in the next session is Hannah Fao, who is the IAPB president. And we also have Mr. Josiah Onyango, who is the COEXA chief executive. So over to you, Josiah and Hannah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome all of you to, to this fourth and final session of the of international partnership events. I am Joseph. Hello. Josiah, you're, you're just breaking up a little bit. We're having oh, difficulty oh. hearing you. Um, H Hannah's also on the line as well. Oh, oh. A, 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 a word of welcome from me to everyone. And I thank uh, the facilitators and presenters of the third session. This is the fourth and the final session of Celebration of International Partnerships online event. And my co-host is Hannah Fall from uh, West Africa. She can say a word as we look at looking at uh, training, leadership, and the future of LINCS program. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. I'd like to thank everybody for staying on throughout the first three sessions and coming into the last lap, which probably the most interesting lap because it brings together all that has been happening in the previous, previous three sessions. In this session, we are going to touch on how does one get the human resource for delivering service? How does one train the human resource for doing that? And how does one get the human resource to think, research, and conduct research? We've got a very good team of speakers and uh, it's in the program, but just to quickly go through that, we've got Melanie and she's going to take us through the training of trainers, which has been a, quite a successful program. Uh, we've got Chiku who has a, an extensive life experience on training of cadres and parts of the country in East Africa. We've got Will Dean, who is moving the frontier on simulation in surgery training, and the huge lessons that have been learned in East Africa on research and leadership uh, mentoring. And we're very, very lucky in this session that IAPB is coming as the chief partner in all that we do to give us a few minutes. It, Peter is a very busy person, and he has accepted to, to have some time with us. And um, I'll try to wrap up at the end with the, uh, the way forward. And um, Melanie will take us through the last uh, poll sessions and the questions and answers, small group discussions, and uh, large group, uh, group discussions. So without much ado, because we've lost a bit of time, I'd like to invite Melanie to take us through the delivering the training of trainers um, project. Melanie? Thank you very much, Hannah. Training the Trainers has been a fabulous journey um, between the RCOP and COEXA. Uh, this has been for eight years. We've been working with over 100 trainers and many of the friendly faces are here now and I've got to know some of them very well. We've worked to create um, ethos that's appropriate for training, to develop skills, to embed processes within units. And this has led on to a sustainable process that can then be cascaded throughout the whole COEXA region. So this has been a benefit to the trainers, to the trainees, and also to the patients. So it started back in 2013 when we got funding from 
um, FET to provide the link. And this was part of a five pronged approach with curriculum, exams, training the trainers, guidelines and professional development. And this was all trying to produce a skilled and motivated workforce who can develop high quality eye care. So we were really trying to develop this group of trainers with high training skills. So as the Royal College faculty, we were working with a coexa faculty and developing them, first of all, to develop trainers um, in local areas so that they could then support their trainees, their consultants and their other allied healthcare professionals to try and provide high quality care. But of course, the trainees become consultants. The consultants get trained up in training, so they become the local trainers. And then they're all on the training pathway to develop into a coex of faculty. So this should lead to a highly effective workforce delivering, delivering high quality care. So we had um, th three different, um, we have four different objectives with this. Um, we had uh, the phase one was embedding the ethos. Phase two was um, developing the skills. Phase three, we then embedded the processes. And phase four, we were cascading teams. And I've just realized that I've got the wrong version of presentation. Apologies. I think the easiest thing might be just to continue with this presentation. Um, sorry, I've just had so many things open. Sorry, Melanie. Um, sorry, do you want to go on to Chiku and I will just sort this out and I'll then come back to you. Terribly sorry. Okay. <laughs> Chiku, are you ready to? Chiku, are you, are you ready to present? Yes, I can. Thank Anything so for much. Melanie. Thank you, Chiku, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, so I will just start sharing my slides. You need to allow me to share my slides. Okay, good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I've been asked to talk about implementing a training program. And um, I'm going to tell you basically the story of how we built a residency program from scratch in Rwanda. And I will start with a backstory and then reach where we are today. You all know the story of Rwanda and the genocide and all that happened. But at the end of all that, Rwanda had one of the greatest shortages of human resources for health in the world. And it was not a time when eye care could be a priority at all. And Rwanda literally spent the first six years just putting the house in order, uh, creating department systems, creating a new ministry of health and all that type of thing. In 2000, Rwanda became one of the first countries to sign the, what was then called the Vision 2020 Blindness Prevention Plan. And out of that plan, the decision was made that the best place to start eye care services for the country would be at the secondary level. With that decision, the first thing was to train the people to work at that level who didn't exist. And a cadre known as the TSO or family technicians was employed, uh, was uh, a training program started. 
to create a group of young men and women who could be deployed to district hospitals in Rwanda. And as we speak, every district hospital has one of, or two of these young people who can diagnose, treat, refract, refer appropriately, and also host surgeons. After sorting out the district level, the next level handled was the primary level. And Rwanda has a primary eye care program which aims to provide an affordable eye test within five kilometers of every household in the country. Uh, these nurses can treat minor conditions, they refer to district hospitals, and they can also do minor refractions using adjustable glasses and also dispense reading glasses. In the first five years, over 2,800 nurses had been trained in all the 502 health centers in the country, and between them had screened over 2.5 million people. So after sorting out those two levels, um, Rwanda then had to move to the next level. By then, uh, it, the eye health workforce was growing steadily. And by 2018, when we started Rio, over 100 mid-level workers were there already working in district hospitals and over 4,000 nurses had already been trained. Our wrap done in 2015 when analyzed showed that in order to tackle blindness in Rwanda, we needed to do something about cataract surgery and about other things like glaucoma and diabetic retinopathy. This then gave us more momentum to do something about training more ophthalmologists. And Rio was started not as a school, but actually as a not-for-profit. And um, we had four components. We had clinical services, which we started in partnership with Dr. Agarwal's ISA uh, hospital. We did research and managed the two rabs that have been done in Rwanda, as well as many other research projects. And we also had community services providing uh, services like cornea transplants to the poor people. So the school was actually the final component. Starting a residency program became possible in 2018 because of four reasons. One was the existence of COEXA. With the existence of COEXA, we had a body that could accredit our, our training. We could have done this through the University of Rwanda where we were both working anyway. But we were ready and the university was not ready because ophthalmology was not their priority subspecialty to start. We were also weary of all the processes that would be out of our hands if we went to the university way. We also felt we could start because of the COEXA TTT program. So those two things were directly from the links program that COEXA has with the, with the Royal College. And I'll talk about those in more detail. But the third reason was the goodwill that we enjoyed from the Ministry of Health and Inter International Partners and also that there was a changing opinion about how postgraduate education should be done in the region. If I start with the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Health was motiv motivated to start residency training in Rwanda because in 2018, all the 16 ophthalmologists in Rwanda had been trained outside the country. Among them, five did not perform surgery and four were at that time undergoing refresher training in cataract surgery, having returned to the country from residency training. Six doctors who'd been sent out previously to train as ophthalmologists had either abandoned their training or chose not to come back and practice ophthalmology in Rwanda, despite having benefited from NGO or government scholarships. And also the MOH thought that local training would allow the residents to be a resource for Rwanda even while they were in training. Because of that, the MOH endorsed Rio as the preferred training site for any doctor who expected government support while in training. In terms of the changing paradigm, the East African, uh, East Central Southern Africa College of Health Science was started by the East African community. And as part of their, in their mementos, you will see that they quote things like, the health ministers noted that there was a limited number of specialists and they wanted additional training approaches to training health specialists to complement the university system. And they thought that this training could be held in various discipline-based professional colleges that would be affiliated to EXA, and that EXA would oversee and coordinate the functioning of these semi-autonomous professional colleges. COEXA is one of the strongest colleges under EXA, and 
the COEXA factor meant that we had a robust professional college that could accredit our trainees. And Rio's accreditation by COEXA was recognized by the regulatory bodies in Rwanda and some of the surrounding countries, which, which unblocked one of the big barriers that we were battling with. The COEXA factor also was that COEXA had a lot of good things happening that were exactly what Rio needed in order to run a good program. And uh, among them was the, the curriculum that was being revised and developed. This revised curriculum is mirrored on the Royal College of Ophthalmologists curriculum, but customized to the, to the region. And this is one of the strongest link activities that have happened under, under COEXA and the Royal College. And we as Rio were just in time to, to embrace this curriculum and start using it. And I always say I'm probably the only person in the region who has read every word in this curriculum, not once, but twice, because I needed it for my program, but also because I had the opportunity to review it uh, and revise it. The COEXA TTT link was another opportunity that came our way at the right time. I do believe that we do need to teach better in order to create better doctors. And I had moved from Kenya to Rwanda as a good clinician with absolutely no knowledge on how to train other doctors. And therefore, when I heard about the TTT program, I embraced it not because it was there, but because I really felt I needed it. And through the LINCS program, I learned um, how to teach adults. I learned how adults learn and how to ensure that this teaching is being translated into learning through doing assessments the right way. So for me, the circle was complete. The curriculum gave me what to teach and the TTT program uh, ticked all these other gaps for me. And you know that I really embraced this program to the effect that I then became the head of training the trainers in the region. You can read more about our program in this paper, which was published some years back, and I'm sure uh, Melanie is going to talk about it in a few minutes uh, and you'll understand the program more. So what's the way forward for our training program? We have 10 trainees in session at the moment. If we train four doctors each year, we will double the number of ophthalmologists in Rwanda by 2026 and still have 12 more in training. During the course of training, the residents are expected to perform a certain number of cataract surgeries as is in the competency-based curriculum. And in doing so, they will be performing 20% of the surgeries done in the country. They are also expected to produce publications before they graduate, and we will then increase also the research output out of Rwanda. How are we doing so far? Our first cohort sat for their ICU exams, which we use as our progression exams last year. And as you will see, they passed both exams that they had to sit on the same day, the visual sciences as well as the optics and refraction. And when we receive the analysis of how their performance, you will notice that in every subsection, the candidates from Rwanda were way above the global average, not just in visual sciences, but also in optics and refraction. Besides this, we actually do have another link. We are really grateful for the link that we have with COEXA, but we do have another link. And this link is with the Wheels Eye Hospital. We established this partnership before we started the school. So we, our, our partnership with WHEELS started as a partnership in research and also in community services. And when we started the school, it was just natural that we would continue with the link. Last year at the AAO, we were asked to, to make a presentation about our link and uh, as you'll see, we discussed a lot of things, but one of the things we talked about was the necessity to relate as peers, not as donors, not as a donor and a recipient. And uh, we have had several activities that have been bilateral. Wheels doctors coming to, to Rio and Rio doctors going to Wheels, not just at the, facul at the trainee level, but also at the faculty level. And those of you who came for Quaxa and Kigali noticed that we had a joint booth with Wheels. Marcia is part of this link. Even though our link is not run out of ICH like the other links, it is Marcia who encouraged us to formalize our link 
And Marcia is probably the most, ex and most experienced person in the world on how a good link should work. So using the advice from Marcia, we, formed, we, we have a formal memorandum of understanding with Wheels I. That process brought in funding for the link, not again from U Europe, but from America, where we have an American organization, Surgical Eye Expeditions, that funds our link. In summary, the setup of Rio has benefited us, has benefited in numerous ways from the COEXA Royal College Links Program. We are very grateful to all those who've been involved and thank you for listening. Excellent. Thank you, Shiku. Thank you very much. We indeed can see what uh, partnerships can achieve. Uh, when we relate to um, as partners, as you've said. Uh, over to Melanie, if you're ready, uh, yeah. we'd want to give you the chance to complete the presentation that you are on. Um, thank you. Thank you. Apologies. Had too, too much going on at the same time. Right. So where I got to was that basically the Training the Trainers program was an eight-year program um, split into sections of two years. So phase one was creating the right ethos. Phase two was developing skills. Phase three was embedding the process, which is exactly what Chiku has just described. And then phase four is um, cascading um, in a sustainable way. So we started by running the supervisor level courses, which were three day events addressing teaching and learning, supervision and assessment, and also program management and training difficulty. And this, the thing about these courses compared to many others is the very high proportion of practical work and skills work and discussions that go on during the courses. So they work in pairs, setting aims and objectives or teaching practical skills. There's appraisal um, uh, role play or training and difficulty role play and also small group discussions that really um, help the learners to get to grips with the material. So the first course was um, run at um, Navasha um, and then for the basically the high level trainers within COEXA. And then we also had the second course that was run in Nairobi. So the purpose of these was that training skills can be learnt or improved. Um, the ethos that a standardized curriculum um, with assessments is really important and that trainees should be supported through good supervision. So in the second phase, um, we moved on to the uh, development of skills and the important things here were that they would be able to, um, to deliver skills um, in whatever training setting they were. At this point, we didn't actually have any funding, so we had to link our events to either the congresses or the exams that were already happening. So the, by developing skills, they learned about interactive teaching in a variety of styles and teaching practical skills, feedback and appraisal, and also techniques for managing trainees in difficulty. So in the third phase, this is really embedding um, the processes as Jiku's just described. Um, so educational supervisors were appointed. Um, the, we, we rolled out national institutional training teams and also Chiku developed the portfolio, which was then transferred to use in the COEXA region. And at this point, um, because there have been several delegates who'd been on quite a number of the courses, they were progressing um, through from being delegate to facilitator to faculty and then with Chiku as the lead. And the important thing was that they were now in a position to be able to go back to their own local units and to deliver the training, the training programs to their local trainers. So this meant that when we moved on to the next phase, we could deliver advanced courses. So these are also three days, but they have split up of separate modules on course delivery, advanced skills, and also complex issues. And on these courses, a lot of the teaching and training is actually done by the delegates themselves, um, either lots of them teaching simultaneously in small groups, supervising practical skills, or here in a large um, lecture theater type setting. But the important bit about this course is that after every single presentation, everyone has detailed peer-to-peer -peer feedback. And it's the learning from that peer-to-peer -peer feedback that firstly makes it sustainable and it really makes the individual enable them to get a lot of um, learning out of the sessions. 
So this took us into phase four uh, when we delivered one course um, in Dar es Salaam. But actually this year we were running an advanced training the trainers course in London and it did happen to be after um, COVID. So we invited the COEXA trainers to come too. Um, so we actually had our first joint training course. So at phase four, we want the cascade to be sustainable. So delivering advanced level courses um, at, for all different levels. Um, for the COEXA faculty to deliver modules to colleagues and also to widely implement in routine practice. So we've had since the um, Dar es Salaam course over the last year, we've had some very good examples of how TTT has been implemented. For example, in Mozambique, they run introductory TTT sessions um, for staff from two hospitals. In Zambia, they've been rolling out an appraisal program. In Kenya, they taught appraisal skills um, to their colleagues that then could then go ahead and implement these. And the Tanzanian Ophthalmological Society ran a TTT session at their Congress. So what have the outcomes been and what are we looking forward to in the future? Well, in phase one, we did some uh, modeling which suggested that over a million patients a year were touched in some way by someone who had been on TTT or managed to cascade the learning. In phase two, uh, we published the outcomes after four years in globalization and health, as Chiku mentioned. Then in phase three, we set up the national teams so that every single country um, actually had TTT trainers. Um, and this is now spreading out to every single institution. And we also, alongside that, started the TT2 program in Indonesia using the same model. We've now delivered three courses in Indonesia. So by the end of phase four, we've now got 108 participants and 23 faculty um, who are trained to be able to deliver most parts of the program. And also the TTT subcommittee is also part of the um, COEXA organization. This has also been a huge benefit um, to the UK, certainly a personal benefit. I, I can't imagine the amount of learning um, and enjoyment and enthusiasm I've got out of this. Um, but also, as we've developed the um, COEXA TTT programme, there's a lot of learning that I, has actually fed back into the UK programme. And the UK programme is definitely better as a result of the, um, of the COEXA experience. So looking to the future, I think that the advanced courses um, we'll still probably need input um, from our Royal College, although COEXA should now be able to deliver the supervisor courses itself. I'm hoping there'll be more joint modules with the UK because at adva advanced level, it's much easier to deliver it over a telelearning platform, whereas it's much more difficult with the supervisor level courses. Um, and there's talk about whether we can cascade this to adjacent countries and also involve non-medical eye care professionals. Um, so this, this has been a brilliant journey, an amazing programme. I think we've achieved a lot and we've certainly enjoyed ourselves and learned a lot out of it. So thank you to COEXA um, for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Melanie, for of the TTT programme that indeed has grown much interest even from the non uh, ophthalmologist uh, speciality. Uh, just uh, speaking from a recent stakeholders workshop we had in Rwanda, we had um, uh, uh, General Sergio who developed quite interest in the short session that was facilitated by Chico. And moving forward for COEXA, we are looking at uh, you know developing a fully run program in house uh, for. We see a change in the national ophthalmology. So, um, looking on next to our uh, presentation, we have um, Dr. Runga doc and leadership mentoring in the Coexa region. Um, I would want to welcome uh, Shafi, who participated in the Lead, lead Forward uh, program uh, that we had uh, over these years of collaboration. So Shafi, if, if you're in the meeting, uh, kindly uh, just feel welcome to share with the audience uh, your experience in terms of what is the take home.
Yeah, uh, I hope you can all hear me. So uh, uh, basically, the uh, Lead Forward uh, workshops, uh, it was a program which was meant at uh, quality improvement uh, in low uh, resource uh, settings by improving the leadership within the hospital settings. And this was mainly done by uh, holding workshops. So for example, for Malawi over a two year period between 2015 to 2017, we had two uh, leadership trainings which were delivered through uh, workshops. And then after that, there was uh, a cascading effect where within our unit, uh, over 20 workshops happened over that two year period. So everybody uh, was empowered to run some kind of a workshop and also to implement, to initiate and implement a quality improvement uh, project. So for the sake of time, just to share some key lessons uh, out of uh, that leadership training which we had, uh, we had a different perspective towards leadership where we learned that uh, the, the traditional approach to leadership where the most senior person uh, is regarded as the leader is not always the most effective approach. Rather, we learned that uh, everyone uh, can be regarded as a leader in their own uh, capacity. And when the eye care team uh, is looked at uh, in this approach, uh, you find that uh, all the members of the eye care team become very motivated to give their best. And uh, everyone, it's easy to share your vision with everyone because everyone is valued that they have a role to play. And another thing we learned is the importance, importance of humility, where if you're in a leadership position, you need to be willing to learn from uh, everyone, basically, at any time in your leadership setting. And uh, this is the way where you, you, you grow as your leader and you also help to, to move your uh, team forward. And another important thing we learned uh, about leadership is that uh, a good leader really needs to be uh, visionary. You need to uh, to assess where you are. Uh, for example, as it's a hospital setting and where you want to take uh, the hospital forward. And uh, you also need to be able to share this uh, vision with all the members of the uh, eye care team. And uh, having a vision is really what separates a leader from a manager because the manager is simply there to uh, to get the job done. So the Lead Forward projects in Malawi, they really had a huge impact. We had a lot of quality improvement projects happening uh, in the hospital. And they were sustainable because they were initiated by ourselves within uh, the hospital. And people were motivated to, uh, to, to sustain this uh, in the long run. And the lessons we got uh, out of that, they are quite applicable to a lot of uh, contexts, not just uh, um, an eye health setting. They can be applicable to uh, a lot of settings in life. So maybe I should stop there. Thank you, Dr. Shafi, uh, for, for your talk. Uh, I'd want to invite Dr. Runga Simon from Barara, Uganda, to give us his bit of, of perspective uh, in his engagement with the research mentorship program. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Runga. Thank you very much, Josiah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so just like uh, Chiku touched on it uh, earlier on, the challenge we had was that uh, many faculty who support residents in training did not have any formal experience or training in how to do that. And so the question was, um, can we take the lessons from the lead forward uh, model and apply that to research? So what we did was uh, in partnership with the ICH, we had the faculty from three universities that is um, Bara University of Science and Technology, the University of Nairobi in Kenya, and um, Kilimanjaro Christian Medical College in um, Tanzania. So we had uh, a, a three-day workshop where these, um, the faculty from 
the ICH provided training to us on how to supervise a master's residence research. And that was a very uh, useful training because it was an eye opener. Many participants had never received this training before. And leaving that meeting, we each had specific um, assignments and tasks to do in our universities, including cascading this training to our fellow faculty, but also uh, being able to support our residents better. We met again after one year uh, to reflect on the changes that had happened in the institutions. And the general feeling was uh, that research supporting uh, residents to do research was now a much more enjoyable experience for both uh, the faculty and also the students. And following this, we um, were able to include that in now in the COEXA conferences, a program where we have uh, a research mentorship support as part of the program that runs alongside uh, the COEXA. Um, so that's, that's a reflection from our side. Uh, we're happy to note that actually what we feel is one of the spin-offs of this is that um, some of our residents like Maureen and Denise went on to actually do well and, um, and get an MSc uh, scholarship at the London School, which they just finished last year. So we feel that was part of a direct spin-off from this because they were able to enjoy research and do better. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Dr. Runga from Barara, Uganda. Uh, maybe just also, also to uh, add on is that we, we've been able to develop out of um, this engagement, the, the research repository for uh, resident thesis in the whole region. So currently we have four participating universities and all the uh, postgraduate, uh, you know, uh, studies are available on our repository as COEXA with quite impressive um, reach across the whole world. We have uh, access to these papers uh, as we trace them. Over 8,000 uh, downloads in 2019 and we, we, we are just glad this is uh, improving our capacity uh, in terms of uh, being able to avail this uh, research uh, work uh, online. Um, to our next presentation, we have um, Dr. Melanie, uh, who will be talking about telelearning and the future. Uh, welcome, Melanie. Thank you. Well, Telelearning is hopefully something that is going to help all these different areas that we've been talking about this afternoon. So the aims for telelearning are really to deliver education in a way that's flexible, accessible and sustainable. We also want to make sure that we can make that we are time efficient, um, cost efficient and try and reduce transport. So the idea is to try and provide ophthalmic education for learners when they want it, where they want it and in the format that is most effective. But whilst doing that, we need to recognise that different modalities suit different learners um, that with different materials and content and different degrees of interactivity. So we have to be very selective about what modality of telelearning we use in what, which situation. The main advantage of telelearning, particularly in this setting, is the widening of participation. So as a college, we can now reach out much more easily to our non-members. We can provide education for all grades, for all professions, even reaching out to public and the students. Um, and certainly the international reach it can achieve is fabulous. So this slide I made for the um, Commonwealth Eye Health Consortium meeting over a year ago now, and it really encompassed my vision for training the trainers um, as to where I hoped it would be going in the future. And really this is something that could apply to any sort of education. So within education, you have a central event. So you can see here that, um, that we might be running a session in London, but simultaneously we might be having sessions in Africa. So the faculty in London will be delivering 
um, some of the lecture type work and some of the large group discussions uh, which the Africans could take part in. But as I said, we have a lot of um, small group work, practical skills and small group discussions involved. So it'd be important that these could actually be delivered in the African setting, delivered by a faculty member that had been trained up uh, previously on the training the trainers course. But for any learning, it's important that the event is supported on either side, firstly by some preparation beforehand, which can be done offline as it were, and then also some consolidation afterwards. But it means that the materials that are produced actually during the sessions can be used um, in terms of audio, video, sharing of slides afterwards, but these can then be fed in to being the preparatory work for future events. So what sort of modalities and resources have we got? Um, if we think first of all about the sort of self-directed learning or advised learning, mandated learning, um, it includes the books, some sort of interactive tasks like reflection and dynamic online work with quizzes and tests. It can be mapped, mapped to curricula or used for CPD. Any of the, these recordings, whether surgery or events like this or specially prepared events can be used and shared later. But also we've now got the remit of live events, certainly with platforms like this, and they can include either observer only um, or interaction in the way we have at the moment. Um, but ideally, I want to move towards this idea of a multi-site facilitated event. And certainly with COVID, we've got some conferences which are now providing online packages for learning. So, but there are quite a few considerations we just need to think about when we're moving education um, into a telelearning environment. Um, we need, from the digital point of view, we need to think about security, confidentiality, privacy, um, and the downside of doing a recording versus the um, live event. Um, from, the, from the social point of view, um, there may be less engagement. I mean, we can still see everybody, but it's not quite the same as having those corridor conversations. Um, speaking to a computer isn't quite the same. People don't come across in quite the same way, but I'm sure we're learning more about it. Um, but the interaction is, is quite controlled. Um, and there's also things to do with the length and managing breaks that's a bit different from when you're doing it live. Um, and the, the educational considerations as well. You've really got to consider the, the, the suitability. Um, and just because you can include everybody, should you be including everybody? We want to still ensure that the juniors or less experienced people have an opportunity to present. Um, and if people say they're going to catch up later, will they really catch up later? The other thing is that if, we, they, if the managers type people think we can do education in, protect, in um, any hour of the day or night, are we going to lose our protected time for education? Um, and then of course, there's a whole load of different funding models that come into play um, when it's then available um, very widely. So what's about the future of telelearning? I think the important thing is that we need to, we need to ride to the challenge. We need to try new things. We're trying a lot of new things today. I mean, not all of them are working 100%, but we're learning as we go along. But I think it's important to try and use the full scope of the opportunities because then hopefully we can fit the best opportunity um, to every type of option that we're trying to deliver. It's important that as well as just education in the sort of more formal type sense, that telelearning can be included in um, sharing sort of clinical and other experiences. We saw a fabulous MDT this morning. We've heard about leadership and so on this afternoon and also training the trainers as to how this kind of learning can happen on a telelearning basis. Um, but also there's all the brainstorming, the discussions. I mean, I think from what came out of one of the things this morning is that um, with this COVID, that people want much more input from each other, for example, about restarting services. But we can have discussions. We actually run one at the Royal College already, a symposium on how do we get restarted in clinical services um, after this. But that's ideally on a, um, an online platform. So I think the thing is that there's, there's, there's plenty of opportunities coming along. We're learning all about them. And the answer is that we need to develop this together to really get the most out of it. Thank you. Uh, great uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Melanie, in terms of looking at the future, actually with the new normal COVID uh, disruption that is um, making us not be able to meet physically and have live events. Um, over to the next presenter is uh, Will Dean, who will talk about uh, surgical simulation. Uh, Thank you, Jessica. Africa. Thank you, Will. 
Thank you, Josiah. Thank you, Hannah. Um, I will share my screen here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is virtually impossible to even attempt to summarize uh, surgical training programs and the importance of partnerships in a week, let alone in 10 minutes. So in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, try and summarize it in two minutes. Um, and that is simply to say that um, the effective surgical training um, not only benefits from, but depends on partnerships and collaborations. And although an, an individual surgeon's journey from novice to expert is uniquely individual, no surgeon learns on their own. There are some fantastic examples of fellowships from the ICO, the clinical fellowship program, uh, where 141 fellowship, uh, fellows were involved from 19 different countries. But looking forwards, um, there could be more South to South surgical fellowships. There should be um, more sharing of resources, and that could be subspecialist expertise, uh, slightly closer to home, um, more sharing of educational resources and having open access to online and other educational resources for surgical training. And then is there a role for simulation-based surgical training? For cataract, certainly manual small incision cataract surgery and FACO, the Royal College of Ophthalmologists have been doing FACO emulsification training courses for over 10 years. For glaucoma, for cornea, vitro-retinal trauma complications, as well as team training and have these integrated into current surgical training curricula um, and develop uh, new modern uh, digital classrooms for surgical training. And the question would be fairly binary. And, and this is the question. If as a trainee or as a trainer, um, if you had the chance to take a trainee to theatre for live surgical training, which trainee would you prefer to be or which trainee would you prefer to take? The one on the left who would be novice to cataract surgery or the one on the right who has undertaken just a four or five day simulation, so intense simulation surgical training course in small incision cataract surgery. Um, and I assure you this is the same trainee four days later after a simulation surgical training course. Um, it's, it's an interesting question with um, hopefully a fairly clear answer. Um, we are already developing numerous uh, training, simulation surgical training centers uh, throughout Sub-Saharan Africa and hope to develop uh, many more in the, in the coming couple of years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Will. Uh, that presentation has been well received, I believe. And I just wanted to remind everyone uh, in the meeting room that uh, we can uh, type our questions on the, on the group chat wall uh, so that we can pick these up in the Q&A and the discussions that will be led by uh, Anna Fall. Um, that opens door for the next presentation by Peter Holland, who is the chief executive of IAPB on Vision 2020 successes and challenges. Thank you. I want to welcome Peter Holland to give us his presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much. And thank you very much for Give me the opportunity to to join you um, and I'm sorry I haven't been able to be with you uh, for longer today. Uh, I've, I've only got a few minutes and will only speak for a, a very short time. I, I also feel frankly slightly fraudulent in talking on this subject because I suspect in the audience are people much better qualified uh, than me, uh, particularly to talk about the experience around Vision, Vision 2020. Uh, and, I, and I think, and I'm sure actually you all know really many of the successes. I, I think I'd point to three or four broad high level ones. Uh, firstly, the, the impact, and, and, and I think that's critically important. The reduction in prevalence, 
in avoidable blindness over, over the Vision 2020 period, and real progress in significant areas like obviously trachoma and onchocerciasis and those sorts of things. And that, that ultimately is the most important uh, success that we see. But I think underpinning that are three big areas. Firstly, around global advocacy. I think Vision 2020 put eye health on the global agenda and kept it there. And that's no mean feat over a period of 20 years. Uh, and, and continues to do so. Secondly, behind that, then mobilise resources, both from governments and new resources from governments, but also from new sources from the corporate sector through things like the Seeing is Believing program, foundations like the Queen, Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Trust. So really drew resources into the sector. And then behind that, and, and, and probably most importantly in many ways, are then the new and innovative programmes, services and partnerships and grew from that, obviously like uh, like this program, like the LINCS program, uh, and then behind that, the infrastructure that was set up at, at mas national level, the many national eye health committees, uh, and then the investment in things like human resources in eye health. So I think all of those are real achievements and real enduring achievements of Vision 2020. And at the same time, uh, I think we're all familiar with, with the challenges that we've now got uh, and I think some of this we probably touched on in the first session. Uh, and in some respects, the World Report on Vision set those challenges out really clearly. We've still got at least a billion people around the world who have vision impairment, whose vision impairment could have been prevented or is yet to be addressed. And critically, huge inequities and inequalities in that. Uh, and, and so that, for me, is the, cha is the challenge we're all involved in tackling uh, and, trying to, and trying to confront. And, and the World Report on Vision sets out the, in a sense, the framework for how you do that. But that in itself is a real challenge because really what it's saying is that eye care needs to be a core part of universal health coverage. In many ways, universal health coverage is not universal if it doesn't include eye care. And so you have to make uh, eye care a core part of the mainstream health system. And it's easy to say, but I mean, that's what you're all involved in, in practice. And that, that is really, it seems to me, the critical challenge over the next 10 years, how we really make that uh, happen. And we build on the experience of Vision 2020, where a lot of that has been going on already. And I wouldn't, and I build, just picking up what Melanie just said, and, and Will just said, the, the, that, that, that is made that much more dif difficult by the situation we find ourselves in now. Uh, and you will all be experiencing this directly, that the impact in COVID-19 is having directly on eye care services and the challenges that we're facing just right now in terms of beginning to restart them and how we, uh, how, how we, get, how we actually set services up so that they can operate safely in the current environment, but then also reassure patients and communities that they can use those services. So that's a real practical challenge that we're up against, which I think we're going to face for some months and years ahead. But I think on long, alongside that, one of, the, one of the risks we face is that having made that real effort to get eye care up the agenda, that there is a risk in which we have to acknowledge that entirely rightly with people's attention on the coronavirus on COVID-19, that we, we lose some of those gains and we slip back down the agenda. So I think for us at IAPB, one of the big, one of the big things we're looking at is, is how as we begin to emerge, we can begin to make the case uh, for eye care that eye care is critical as part of as, as part of rebuilding health systems but i think more broadly beginning to make the case that it's also crucially part of the the broader development agenda that in a sense it's part of that it's essentially it's part of the golden thread that runs through the sustainable development goals uh, and and you know while like while um while that's I, I do think that's challenging. I think, I think this, won't, this won't be easy for us to do. There, there, I, I'm quite optimistic as well. And just one example of that, we had a meeting at the beginning of this week of the UN Friends of Vision in New York, which was done via this mechanism. Uh, and we had over 40 member states attending, 40 countries, most of them represented at ambassador level, which is, is pretty unusual in a forum like that. Normally they send some junior desk officer along. We had, you know, we had over 20 ambassadors there. And, and really, a, 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 they were basically saying that what they really wanted to do was to make eye health really part of their discussions on the sustainable development goals and put eye health as part of the development agenda as, as well as part of the health agenda. 
So, so I think that's, you know, that's one small positive sign. Beyond that, I think what that means is we've got to look to work in partnership, both within the sector and, and outside the sector and look at new partners who are in education and employment and economic development as well to, to bring them on board too. But I think that's also where this program is a real exemplar because of course, you know, you've shown what partnerships do uh, across uh, internationally. And that's something that of course is very dear to IPB's heart because that's what we are. So, so I think those lessons are really crucial and um, should give us some hope that the, even though the challenge, there, there are some tough, tough challenges ahead that, that we, can, we can face them. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Peter, for your uh, great talk. And, and just uh, looking at, rec recalling to mind about the uh, discussion at the uh, Health Minister's Conference meeting in uh, Lusaka, Zambia this year was uh, a big debate about positioning eye care to be part of the national health debate. Uh, and then, and, and, uh, Closer home, it is said we we need we don't need to take the eye out of the body. We need to be part of the discussions about national health agenda. So, without much uh, talk, I want to welcome uh, Hannah Fall, who is going to lead uh, the session on uh, the way forward. Hannah Fall. Thank you very much, uh, Josiah. And I, I, I am just overwhelmed at the progress that has been made, um, the diversity of it, the multifaceted nature um, it has taken, and, and all in a very, very short time. Uh, congratulations to all the countries, all the speakers, and everyone who has worked so hard uh, to get this um, going in all countries. Um, there's so much to say about the way forward. Um, so it's, it's what I tried to do was to extract what I thought were the golden nuggets uh, from what I had listened to in this session. And then um, share some of my thoughts on what I think the way forward is. I think the very first one uh, really impressed with was the, the training of traders and the fact that they have built in a monitoring and evaluation so that they can collect the evidence to say what, uh, how successful it has been. And that's something I would want us to encourage. And the telelearning for me is, is for much of Sub-Saharan Africa is the proof of the, of the pudding, it's in the eating. It, they have shown that yes, telelearning can be done um, what are the pitfalls, what are the problems, and, and, and so people who have a mental block to telelearning can say, well, no, it's not that difficult, uh, we can get it done. On, the, on, on Chiku's uh, uh, presentation, and what struck me there is, is that there she is, she was doing it absolutely from scratch. Um, and taking advantage of anything that was going on that would help her uh, in that journey. So the word that came to my mind was fast tracking. Chiku fast tracked uh, human resource uh, development. And much of the links with COEXA and the Royal, Common, uh, Royal College of Ophthalmologists is the adoption of a stepwise approach. I mean, Chiku had shared that earlier with us. The first stage was that the, the mentors from the Royal College came down to East Africa and walked the walk, and got themselves familiar with the terrain of their trainees. The second time, they let their trainees take the baton and they walked beside them. And the third stage is they let them go. They ran with it and they provided the support. So I think that stepwise approach uh, as, as was adopted was very wise and, and I, I, I would say that even in the surgical training programs, the simulation is something very similar. Uh, it's fast tracking, but it's also a stepwise approach. So in terms of concepts, we've learned a lot from them. 
the research uh, uh, supervision for me uh, pointed out two things. The word research uh, for clinical practitioners is always something that belongs to another world. It's too difficult to do. And the lesson that has come out of this is that, yes, it can be done. It can be done properly. It can be done to the highest standard. And finally, the fact that it all got embedded. The COEXA made it policy, institutionalized all that has been happening. So it has been tremendous, really, uh, what has happened. Um, I, to, to summarize, I, I cannot say everything, but to, to summarize from my perspective, what's the way forward? And I feel that number one, partnership as defined in this program, uh, the relationship between human beings should continue. We should continue it and it should not be in the realm of feelings. Uh, it should be in the realm of science. We should try to get the evidence to show that partnerships and relationships is a good way to go. Number two is the concept of a ripple. Uh, where the, uh, a stone is thrown into a pool, the ripples form, and I can see the ripple widening and widening. It's widening to the COEXA countries, but I have no doubt that it would widen to the rest of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. I want us to adopt the successful strategies that have come out of this uh, partnership, not just celebrate it, but adopt the successful strategies. And we cannot do that if we do not document. So I would implore all those who have done this work to document it um, so that it goes, it has a life and is read and studied by others. Um, the institutionalization is extremely important. Many governments are very bu bureaucratic. So like COEXA has done, it's made it policy and it's made it a process of their annual meetings to hold these meetings so that it's done in a way that is affordable. The audience is all the ophthalmologists who attend. So again, we are fast tracking a process. Now, preparation for innovation because we have a new normal. the new normal of telelearning. It's multifaceted. Telelearning has come to some. I'm passionate about climate change. So there is, there is an impact, a very positive impact of telelearning on climate change. And just like the COVID-19 virus is exponential in its spread, I think telelearning is exponential in its spread of knowledge and skills. So we can learn a bit from COVID-19 virus. The, my last two things are a bit controversial. Um, the Royal College is one college, limited resources and limited faculty and so on. But I think we can explore, the, explore partnerships in other regions of Sub-Saharan Africa, seeing it as a North-South, but also seeing it as an intra-African. We don't leave it all to the Royal College. But even within Africa, we can do partnerships. With, within uh, South South, we can do partnerships. There, there's so much to learn of good practice that has come out of uh, this celebration. Um, and my last point is on technology. Um, technology is important even for the training. We need to look at the technology that we need uh, to invest in to for the training primarily, but also for the service delivery so that to ensure a high uh, economic rate of return on the training. There's nothing I find as painful and as wasteful as training someone for service delivery. And when they get home, they haven't got the technology to implement what they have learned. So again, the way forward can, we cannot go without looking at technology for training and technology for uh, service delivery. And we're very lucky with the explosion of long distance uh, 
thinking and work that uh, the medical profession is keen into that uh, investment in distance teleconsultation, telesurgery, and uh, ophthalmology cannot uh, be left behind. So um, that's, that's my summary. It's a very short one. I've got many other things in my mind, but it's just to say how excited I am at this age to see all these young people. You know, I wish I were 30 years younger. So thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anna Fal, for the wonderful summary. Uh, and uh, without wasting much time, I will. I think we might go straight into the uh, participant poll. Thank you very much, Josiah. So we've done one poll already to find out about who you are. We're now going to find out some more about your thoughts. Um, so Graham, if you could please put up the first poll. So we've mentioned a little bit about lockdown. Um, I think we have to have a few thoughts on that. So, but what should our priority be until lockdown lifts? So regular remote meetings, unit to unit, or regular remote meetings that are specialty based? Should they be remote webinars of large groups, for example, restarting services, new ways of working, or should we just wait until the, fi the flights reopen? Okay, so if you just choose one of those buttons to, to click, and I'll just wait until the length of the bars has stopped growing in front of me. Right, we're over 50% of you have voted there. So let's end that poll. Um, Josiah, do you want to make a comment about how we might deal with addressing new ways of working? I'm not sure, Josiah, you're on mute actually, or whether your connection's dropped off. Sorry, Melanie, I, 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 my, my connection was unstable. Thank you. Um, I don't know whether you just want to pass a comment quickly on that or before we move on to the next one. I think well, in the, in, I, 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 out of the poll, we can see 60%, 62% um, would prefer remote webinars uh, with the COVID scenario uh, persisting, which is actually uh, the way to go currently. Uh, we know online uh, events will not perhaps replace the need for live, uh, you know, uh, experiences, but it, it provides a, a very viable alternative looking into the way forward. With 1% okay. um, actually waiting for flights to, to, to reopen. So that says a lot that we we have an, a viable alternative in, in, in having in hosting virtual events. Perhaps we all just went to get out of lockdown. <laughs> okay, let's go on to the second poll. Right, so this one is really forward looking beyond the end of, of COVID. So how would you like to be involved in partnerships in the future? So giving remote support to an existing links partnership, becoming actively involved in an existing links partnership, including going on visits, um, help set up a new link, remote only, or help set up a new link partnership, including visits. So we've got remote support to an existing link, active involvement in an existing link, or set up a new remote only link, or set up a new link, including visits. Okay, we're over 50%, so we'll end at that. Uh, so Hannah, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on this. On this, um, I'm excited. The actively involved in existing, yes, I'm, for me, I'm taking that as a given. 
but I'm excited about people who want to set up a new link partnership, including the seats. And I would say add to that the long distance partnership as well. So yes, um, those two stand out. So it's partnerships, partnerships, partnerships. Good, and a, and a, and a few flights along the way might be helpful. <laughs> yes. Good, okay, so at this point we're going to go into um, some small group discussions. So um, this is your opportunity to talk with people you probably haven't met before. Um, you can talk about what interests you most, but we will give you some questions also to guide your thinking. Um, you'll be randomly allocated to those rooms just as you were this morning. We're going to give you a bit longer in which to chat. Um, so it'd be useful if, if somebody happens to take the lead and try and encourage everyone in your group to talk. Um, if you unmute yourselves and put your videos on, it'll just help you to get engaged. And if you could also appoint a scribe to the room as well, who could then feed back to um, <laughs> Appoint a scribe who can feed back to um, either Marcia Roberts or Education at the Royal College, because um, we're very interested to hear your views. And also the lead might well want to think of one key point um, that will be able to come out in the discussions later. So the, the two questions that I want you to um, think about is where should partnerships be going next? And how would you like to be involved? So where are we going next and how would you like to be involved? So you'll disappear into your rooms now and then you'll get a warning before you then automatically come back. Um, and then we'll go into the large group discussion. So that didn't quite work quite as planned. Right, do you want to have another go at that, Graham? So when we go into our groups, we're going to be looking at where should partnerships go next and how would you like to be involved in the partnership? So we'll just see if Graham can manage to get the, um, the breakout rooms to work. Um, so, Graham, I think if you could take off the slide at this point, I just want to see how many people we've got left in the main room. If you're in the main room still, the, the, it's probably a notification on your screen um, getting you to agree to going into your small group breakout. So if you can just press OK to accept going into your small breakout group, um, that would be fine. Oh, that's good. We haven't got too many people left in the main room. Um, if you can hear me, if you can just um, take off your videos and take off your microphones and we'll run this group as, a, as, a, as another small group if you happen to be left in the room here. So if you can just unmute yourselves.
maybe I've got the people who aren't really there. Let's just see if any of you are there. Oh, I've got got somebody there. That's good on the on the video. Excellent. I'm, we can un, unmute you. <laughs> So can, are you able to unmute yourselves? Yeah, you can now. Yeah, there we go. Good. Right. So if, if, if anyone's still here, I see, oh, we've got, we got um, John and Alan and various people. If you're able to unmute yourself, then that would be useful. Um, but anyway, the two of us could have a discussion. Um, so where, where, where do you see the partnerships going next? Are you talking to me? I'm talking to you because I'm not sure. <laughs> I think we're the only ones here. <laughs> I'm not sure how many other people are listening. So, well, the, the, I've been. The, my link has been. Oh, I think everyone's is everyone coming. Everyone's coming back again. Right. Uh, okay. Don't don't worry. I think okay. everyone's re, rejoins the main room. Okay. Well, that was a very short one again. Um, I think what we'll do at this point is we will go um, straight into the, um, the the question and answer discussion for the large group discussion. So I'll hand over. So can we start the questions? Yep. Yeah. Uh, there are a few questions sent to the chat. Uh, is Mike there? I am. Yes. There is one question to Mark. And the question says, after 16 years of excellent work with the links, what does she see as the next steps? Marcia, what are the next steps for the links? Well, again, I have to say that it's really not about what exactly what I think, but I, I, I can hear from what we've listened to today that um, it is a good way forward to do what even what has happened today to have opportunity to share learning um, together. And also, um, particularly what Chiku was talking about and looking at um, that whole training aspect, um, but doing it collegially, so collegiately. So it's not, for example, the UK going overseas to give their input, it's shared learning together. So they're faculty on both sides. And I think that that is a brilliant example of a way forward. Good. Another question was addressed to Shiko. And the question was, how difficult was it to convince those bodies to give you accreditation as a non-university institution? Okay. You are mute. Mm. Okay. Uh, good evening. Um, I have to say that it was not easy. In terms of the medical board in Rwanda, I think that, like I said, the fact that the regional uh, bodies were beginning politically to encourage uh, college-based education helped us a lot. Uh, we had a track record as trainers and clinicians in Rwanda as the found founders of Rio, so that helped also. I think the inclusion of some mandatory international benchmarks like the IC exams helped our case also. And when we presented our training model, it's, it was more structured than a lot of the existing specialty programs. So I think all those together helped the uh, registration bodies to endorse the program. And recently there's been similar sentiments from the bodies in Kenya, Tanzania, um, Zambia, I think, when we did a similar presentation. In terms of accreditation from COEXA, that is one of the hardest exercises that I've ever had to go through. The accreditation team was led by the heads of departments of all the existing programs. Um, and at that time, there was a bit of uneasiness about training going outside universities. I think there was some sympathy because after all I was their student and uh, 
they knew that they train good people. And Dr. Ilako and Professor Kagame were quite uh, sympathetic and supportive of what we were trying to do. Having a good curriculum, having the tools for both summative and formative assessments and for supervision, which I had just adapted from what I learned in TTT. We were lucky to have good space as well as a modern training hospital and access to large numbers of faculty, not just in-house, which were not so many, but also through our partners, uh, Agarwal, as well as Wills. I think accreditation is by COEXA is, uh, to add on to what you asked Marcia, should be part of the way forward because a lot of institutions are beginning to want to do what Rio has done. And the accreditation processes through COEXA need to be robust. And this is somewhere else where links can be forged to show what standards should be for accrediting new institutions. So I'm grateful we got through all this, but it was not easy. Thank you. Uh, yes, another question was open question to anybody who can answer. They say those who benefited from the links trainings, how many have started training others and how many are ready to start training others? And if not, what are the, what are the challenges? Why, why, does it not, why does it not happen? So that is open to those who benefited from the links training programs. So feel free anybody to unmute yourself and make a comment. It's a bit, a bit quiet at the moment. <laughs> what, while they're thinking, John, I think you need to explain how you could look to your left and uh, say to Chiku, uh, <laughs> you're still muted. Uh, I think if I can read John's mind, he's <laughs> trying to ask whether, why those who benefited from links, do they feel that in future they will also be able to create links from their institutions to other institutions within their countries maybe? And I think it's a valid question. I think as Rio, when we are mature and are more experienced in this, We'll be quite happy to mentor maybe the mid-level training program within Rwanda. And uh, we, yeah, we, we should propagate what we've learned. I, I have really been shadowing and uh, trying to suck all the juice out of Melanie in order to become as good as her in TTT. And I hope that I will somehow be able to encourage others the way she has encouraged me. Thank you. Uh, I think Melanie wanted to say something. Well, th thank you very much, Chiku. I mean, I've, I've just been so thrilled the way that you have actually taken um, what we have built up over many years um, in our Royal College and compressed it into literally a very short amount of time and deliver it to, to such a high level. So um, incredibly impressed with that. Um, the other comment I did want to make was relating to the um, telelearning and basically remote interaction because we've had a lot of experience of this in the last two months. And one of the things I think we found is that if people have had previous face-to-face -face interactions, they've had live links, live partnerships, um, then transferring onto a remote platform is relatively easy because you've actually got all that background. You know what people are like, you know how they respond, you know what expression on their face means and things like that. Um, whereas when you're setting up um, new engagements, on a remote platform for the first time, then that becomes a bit more difficult. So I see that you know, telelearning is not going to replace completely um, all the things that we've got. There's a really, really important place um, for that, that feeling of cohesiveness that you actually get through working with somebody in the same space on the same project. So I think this is where it comes down to being very selective about what we use things for. And I was glad to see that all of you felt that you still wanted to um, do an active partnership rather than purely a remote partnership. 
So Melanie, can I, can I just say something that we also learned um, is that a lot of us and, and in many countries, they, they also started doing a lot of video consultations with patients as well. And that, that technique and the way how you talk on the phone and how you behave and where you sit and everything is, is extremely important. So in adding to the training as to how to behave on camera, um, it's also important to appreciate that, that the, the once, if you want to do it with the patients as well, there is another level of complexity. And I completely agree with you. It is much easier to do, for example, follow-up conversations <coughs> with patients you've seen before than, than court calling. And, and unfortunately, we, we all experienced that in the last two, year, two months, you have so many extra emails and, and links to click on. It's, it's, it, the management and the human behavior of it and what we have learned, we can propagate elsewhere as well. Um, thank you. Can I just ask, is Bernie Chang uh, uh, available? Bernie, are you? Are yeah, you I'm here. Excellent. So just to introduce you, Bernie, uh, for those who don't know, I demitted from my post as president of the College, Royal College of Ophthalmologists in May, and I'm pleased to say that Bernie took over. So Bernie, the ch question I have for you is, uh, can you, A, can you introduce yourself? And B, can you give us some pointers as to where you think the LINCS program between the two colleges is going in the next few years? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, th thanks, Mike, for introducing me and giving me the opportunity just to say a few words. Uh, actually, just in case I don't get the chance, congratulations to the organizers for organizing this uh, successful and very informative uh, webinar. Uh, I also want to congratulate everyone who has uh, presented uh, today, sharing their experience. Uh, it's, it's clear that patients uh, have benefited and will continue to benefit from all your hard work. And, and personally, I'm both impressed and very heartened to know that there are such good links out there between uh, international partners. I think we've got to acknowledge your role, Mike, in cementing our college's link with COEXA. Uh, and also uh, acknowledge Will Dean, who's our college's uh, chair of the International Subcommittee for his efforts. And Melanie, uh, for sharing your immense uh, experience and knowledge on educating trainers. Uh, I think it's always true that people who give get more back uh, in return. So as, as the new president, I would certainly love to build on the uh, close re relationship we have with John through COEXA, with the ICEH and the Vision 2020 links program. Uh, and, uh, you know, with COVID, we don't know what's happening, but I would look forward to meeting with, with, with you and working with, with you, be it virtually or, or, or in person. Uh, and I would certainly like to see uh, an increased um, collaboration between uh, the RCOP uh, and, and, and all the, the, uh, uh, the partners out there. And I think you know, in that small group session, there's clearly uh, the opportunity to increase the number of countries and places that we form these links. So I look forward to uh, hopefully playing a small part in that. Thanks, Mike. Thanks very much, Bernie. Um, I know you will uh, take the program forward and I'm just gonna ask whether uh, John, could give some comments as the COEXA president. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I think it has been a very good day. We've learned a lot in terms of what is happening between different partners. As COEXA, we look forward to continuing our partnership with the Royal College to take forward uh, what we've achieved so far. As we add more countries on our region, we are going to need more support to keep going together. This, uh, I think, has been a good experience and I look forward to the next 10 years to see how far we'll be when we're celebrating again in 2030. Uh, I think there's still probably some people who wanted to comment. I don't know if uh, we have time for that. Otherwise, I give back to Mike to conclude. No, I, I, who, if you've got people, do, do shout them out, John. I, I can't see who they are, but feel free to invite people. Beverly Wright has got a hand up. Okay. Good morning. Good morning from Jamaica. Um, we have benefited from the LINCS program here in many ways, and um, 
we are hoping to continue to, to roll the program across the island. Um, we have about 3 million persons in Jamaica, and so far the Lynx program has benefited about 2 million. So that's, that's quite a, a, a lot of, of um, outreach given so far. But we were thinking of some training program locally for the um, nurses, for the um, optometrists, and um, for the screener graders. Currently, screener graders are trained at the University of the West Indies through collaboration directly with the um, Lynx program in London. But I don't know, there's a possibility that we could do something as Chico, Chico did <laughs> in, um, in her country. But we could discuss that going forward. And I just want to reiterate that the Lynx program has been extremely helpful to us in Jamaica. Thank you. Thank you very much. In my experience, um, the best person to ask in these circumstances is Marcia. When Marcia has asked a question, she, uh, she takes it forward in a way that I don't see anybody else achieving. Um, so uh, Marcia, that's over to you. Um, is there anybody else, anybody's identified that wanted to make a comment? If not, I thought it was probably nearly time to, to, to wrap up. Melanie? Mike, if you can allow, I, I'd like to ask uh, Brent Finclier or John Arnold from Wheels, if yes. they can say, give a comment about what she could talk about, about the links between Wheels Eye and uh, Rio. They can make a short comment. Brent, are you there or John Arnold? Yeah, uh, maybe they are muted. I think you can go ahead, Mike. Okay. Well, um, I would like to thank uh, Melanie, Graham and Hugh for bringing this program together. I would very much like to thank all the participants, both the people who presented and those who listened. It's been a long but very interesting day. I'd also like to thank all the organisations represented here. I think at the beginning of the day, we reflected on the fact that we were celebrating the Vision 2020 initiative launched in 1999 by the World Health Organization and the IAPB with the aim of eliminating avoidable blindness by the year 2020. I think we all recognize that we haven't finished that work, um, but one of the big things that have come out of it is the links across nations. And I think the best thing for me has been, been working as a party, a community of ophthalmologists determined to drive forward the Vision 2020 goals. The work is unfinished. Um, we do have unfinished business. And I think as we go forward, I think maybe we should remember the words of the United Nations General Assembly 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which I'll quote for you. As we embark on this great collective journey, we pledge that no one will be left behind. Recognizing that the dignity of the human person is fundamental, we wish to see the goals and targets met for all nations and peoples and for all segments of society. And we will endeavor to reach the furthest behind first. So that's our job team. That's what we're going to deliver over the next 10 years. And uh, hopefully, as John says, we'll meet again uh, to discuss how far we've got uh, I'm going to say goodbye now and hand over to Melanie as the organiser. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, it's been great to have you all on today. What we would love you to do is we're going to be sending out the evaluation forms. So please ensure that you return your evaluation forms because that's how we can develop this kind of event, the links pro pro um, partnerships. Um, and we do want to have your ideas. You know, people have been putting things on the chat about how do I get involved um, on your evaluation form. If you want to put your email address on there, then we can pick up on that and contact you directly. So that information is really important to us. So please just fill out your evaluation form as soon as it arrives. So thank you very much. In, ce in celebration, can we clap and dance? Celebrate, 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 celebrate
congrats to me. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, Thank everyone. You Thank, much, you for, Thank you for your time. Much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, bye everyone. Thank you. Bye so bye. bye everyone. Thank you.